Progress, right? Progress, <laughs> right? Not perfection, but certainly progress. Keep up. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get this, uh, this Sunday speaker started. Um, hello, all the humans. Uh, I'm Ron Russell, Program Director here at HSGP, and welcome to the ninth HSGP Digital Sunday Speaker. Uh, we will continue to provide content digitally until we can gather again. Yes, uh, miss you all. Uh, if anyone wants to help provide content uh, or has content, please see me or one of the other directors. Um, on 913, uh, we have a what's important to you about humanism, what you'd like to share during our Sunday speaker series on 913. It's the community Sunday speaker. So if you are a member and have something of passion that you want to uh, contribute, by all means, come forward, talk to myself, talk to Mars, talk to any of the directors, and they'll put you in contact with me. Uh, and it's a it's an open forum for you to have a bit of the mic. So uh, ground rules for the meeting, stay muted unless you're actively speaking. Don't be offended if I mute you due to background noise or you're just hanging out with your mic open. Uh, raise your hand to ask questions during the Q&A and I will call on you. If you type your questions into the chat, uh, I will go ahead and read them. Uh, share the air, practice the 10 commitments of humanism and after the recording stops, hang out and chat and just catch up if you'd like. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Luke Douglas, our executive director for the executive director update. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody virtually. Um, my name is Luke Douglas. I'm the executive director of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. We are very proud to be able to meet together and have these thought-provoking conversations, um, though we would prefer to do them in person and look forward to doing them in person again. Everything that we do is made possible by our members. We are a membership organization and therefore uh, wanted to give a shout out to everybody who has recently either joined HSGP, found a home in our HSGP family through either a new membership or renewing. I know I've seen a couple of membership renewal updates come through and I wanna just welcome you back again to another year at HSGP. I have a slightly more personal update as many of you would have seen on Facebook. My wife, Sarah, tested positive for COVID about a week ago. It was last Saturday. We had already been symptomatic for a few days, both of us, so we knew that this was a possibility. And I just wanted to thank everybody for the outpouring support that we've seen. We have more offers, people to bring things to our door and leave groceries on the doorstep than we would ever need. We have more offers of people to help, to send good thoughts, thoughts and prayers, whatever whatever it is <laughs> that you send to support, I, I definitely couldn't have asked for a more supportive family through all of this. So working with COVID has been a little bit of a lighter week. I haven't had quite the stamina to do what I would normally do, but I do have one very exciting update. Now that I'm starting to feel better physically, um, we applied for a grant to get some outside money to renovate our children's room and have a better children's program with updated toys and updated a better facility and new carpet and possibly even a mural to put some public art on the inside of the children's area wall. As of yesterday, I got the update. We received $2,500 with no strings attached to use. We wanted to use it on that project, so we are still planning to, but because it, it doesn't have any strings attached, we are able to do what we want to with the children's room. And if we have any surplus, we can put the remaining funds to any purpose that we want to. It is a huge infusion of good news into a time that's already a bit lean and a little uh, drab in the news department. So that being said, thank you all for your support. Uh, Susan, question, who's the grant from? It's the James Hervey Johnson Charitable Trust. And I know you had a history of getting money from them at times when you were, um, when you were the HSGP president. So thank you so much for passing me your file on that charitable trust. and allowing us to keep going back for support. And with that, Alex has the president's update. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody's faces. It's uh, amazing to see you right now. Um, well, for the update from the president, uh, right now, HSGP is, is actually doing some really amazing stuff behind the scenes. Um, the board is, is going through and checking out uh, a whole bunch of stuff that we need to get uh, ready for for 2021, including nominations for the 2021 board, which brings me to this. Carol, our treasurer, has, for personal reasons, 
chosen to not run for the 2021 treasurer's uh, seat on the board, which means we are in need of a treasurer for 2021. So if you would like to see how the sausage gets made or even help make the sausage, speak to myself and we will get you set up for the 2021 treasurer's board. It, ideally, this will be someone who has accounting experience, uh, whether they be a CPA or tax preparer, some, uh, something along that line. Um, we will be uh, creating budgets. We'll be making sure that monies are dispersed in a, in a proper manner. So speak, uh, uh, speak to me after the meeting. I'd like to get you set up as far as uh, being on the board for 2021 in the treasurer's position. The last thing that I wanted to mention is I'm very proud of the team that we have now. We've got uh, a lot going on, like I said, going on behind the scenes. And uh, the cool thing about that is we're starting to get noticed uh, in the public. Uh, our membership as far as uh, just, you know, people showing up is, is expanding. Our dues paying membership is slowly expanding as well. We'd like to see those numbers rise. So if you can, uh, I know things are maybe difficult right now financially, but if you can, if you can become a member today, that'd be great. If you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, that'd be great. Everything, every little bit helps. And we certainly appreciate all of you. We want to hear your voice. We want to have you uh, engaged and, and uh, we do appreciate all of you. So that's it, the end of the president's update. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, it, we have been getting a lot of interesting notice. Uh, so events online that we've done, I'd like to go over some of the things that we have been doing. Uh, we have our coffee socials, our humanist meditation. I believe Let's Geography has gone online as well. Uh, Leaving Religion uh, is, is still going. Uh, and uh, on August 1st, Secular AZ had uh, Joe Blankenship with Americans United for Separation of Church and State uh, talking about uh, theocracy, oligarchy, and democracy. Uh, we are on week four of Becoming Anti-Racist, a workshop for white people. So you want to talk about race by Ijoma Eluo. Uh, I'm getting that name down finally. Uh, our last session is August 11th. Um, we had a blood drive yesterday on eight. Sorry, week five. We're on our last week is coming up this this Tuesday. Yeah, we've completed week four. So our last week is coming up on Tuesday. Um, we have our blood drive uh, that we did yesterday on 8-8, which was a great success. Um, and then uh, hopefully everybody had the opportunity to watch the AHA digital conference distant but together. Um, I believe that they're going to issue those as recordings at some point in time, but I, I left the conference being inspired, uh, and I hope that if you have the opportunity to see those, uh, you are likewise inspired. Um, upcoming projects that we have, uh, the last and final uh, workshop for white people on becoming anti-racist is Tuesday from 3 to 4.30. Uh, please join if you've read the book. Uh, on Friday, August 14th, we have the Humanities Project, uh, The Truth About the Confederacy in the U.S. Uh, on Secular Saturday on uh, August 15th, uh, we have Lindsay Love, Chandler Unified School Board member. Uh, and then on 823, uh, our special Sunday speaker series, 50 Years of HSGP, a chat with Susan Sackett and Hal Safferstein. Uh, that will be Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, uh, on September 11th, we have a Humanities Limerick Project. So uh, by all means, uh, dust off your limerick skills. Uh, and then finally, on 913, we have the Community Speaker Series, uh, where uh, our members have the opportunity to come up and talk about humanism and what's important to them. Uh, if you're interested in any of those things, uh, look us up on Meetup, on Facebook, on our website. Pick your medium, uh, but please get engaged and involved. Uh, I don't believe we have a humanist minute. Uh, is there anyone that would like to raise their hand and do the humanist minute? Or you can just unmute yourself. No? Going. Hey, Ron, going. could I read part of that little thing that I wrote? Absolutely. Calling. Yep. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's me, Mars Delator. 
your volunteer coordinator. Um, not too long ago, I put calls out to all the members. So I might have spoken to some of you and uh, had really great conversations. And I know there's many of you that I didn't get to speak to. And it would be fantastic if we could talk when I had the opportunity to make the calls again. And so I put the calls out to the members. So it'd be really great. Again, like Alex was saying, if you could look into joining with HSGP. Um, so what I wanted to put together a little um, bit of information about the things that I learned from the community during the, this call. And so I'm just gonna read a little bit from this little article that I wrote. Uh, okay, so I called the list of members and there were robo screeners and voicemails aplenty, but so many of you picked up a call from an unknown number, such optimism. And thank you again so much for the amazing conversations. We talked philosophies and politics, caught up about work and the kids, and I learned more about the history of HSGP. Mostly though, I just got to know a wonderful group of humans a little bit better. And here's what the members of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix told me about how they're spending the summer. So the Greater Phoenix area is home to most of our members, but I spoke with people all over the state and calls went out across the country to Washington, California, Colorado, Iowa, Ohio, and Virginia. Several HSG HSGP families are already used to flying out of here once the snow melts in their winter roosts. And some just took this unexpected opportunity to visit family out of state and others just have moved and still support us. And living the isolationist life was already status quo for many of our members that I connected with. A few folks who were in their RVs. One member was installing solar panels to support cryptocurrency farming in Golden Valley. And another was with her husband and cats exploring the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And if you could find them, you'd see others doing well in a hidden out of the way area in the furthest corner of a very remote section of nowhere in Canada. Our community includes doctors, librarians, teachers, nurses, engineers, gardeners, and sailors. People are learning how to juggle, spin wool, use a 3D printer, and a new sewing machine. They're playing bridge and chess, saxophone and piano. Members are teaching Spanish and Japanese, making art, collecting coins, and raising chickens. And they're reading lots of books. I got a lot of recommendations for some summer reading so hope to share that with you all soon. And these days, of course, members are sharing the challenge of learning the new technology, Zoom, and we can't avoid it for school, work, family, and fun. And so they're, everyone's connecting to organizations, organizations they support in addition to HSGP. So Secular Coalition of Arizona, Americans United, Sierra Club, Humanity Forward, among many were the groups that were mentioned. And I did receive just primarily positive reports from everyone about their families and health and livelihoods, but there certainly are some members that are feeling extra lonely living in isolation. And some of them are a little bit older and suffering the pain of illness or the loss of a loved one or definitely missing connections with the family. And for some of our members, they probably couldn't make it here with us because using the computer and video technologies is still really difficult. And so, you know, if you can continue to think of a way that we can reach out to our community members, maybe you don't mind putting together a little video or something that shows how to get on Zoom, even though it's really simple, maybe that could be something helpful. Um, if you, again, I'm the volunteer coordinator. So if you are interested in participating, um, like everyone is saying about running for a board, learn more about what we do, or just kind of want to mention some things that you're interested in doing to help build a community, I'd love to hear from you. Again, I'm Mars, and you can reach me the best using volunteer at hsgp.org. Thanks, everybody. It feels really great to be part of this community. Thank you very much, Mars. That was awesome. Uh, and thank you so much for reaching out to everybody. I was inspired by that. Um, so 
editing break here. Uh, so uh, to get into the speaker section, uh, hello all the humans. Welcome to the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix Digital Sunday Speaker. I'm Ron Russell, Program Director at HSGP. If you like our content, please smash the subscribe button. No, really, subscribe. If you want to contribute in any uh, more material way, please become a member, donate to our Patreon account, or volunteer. Today, we have Dr. Dwight Moore, the 2021 State Chair for End of Life Options. And why this aligns with our values uh, aligns with empathy, responsibility, and altruism. Empathy, the understanding of another's perspective, to step outside of your own perspective to consider someone else's thoughts, feelings, or circumstances. Responsibility, conscious ownership of one intention, one's intentions and actions, and being accountable for the resulting consequences. And altruism, seeking to alleviate the suffering and hardship of others with compassionate action. Dr. Dwight Moore is a retired industrial psychologist who worked for uh, corporate executives uh, and helped the medical aid and dying bill get passed in California. He's an absent volunteer in Washington State for medical aid and dying and is next year's state chair for Arizona End of Life Options. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Dwight Moore. Ron, thank you very much. Um... Wow, it's an honor to be part of this organization. It's wonderful to hear all the activities you're involved in. Uh, it's great to hear that, Luke, you're feeling better. Um, Mars reached out to the volunteers. That's a terrific, uh, terrific job on her part. And so thanks for including me. Um, I'm going to tell a couple of stories today as a way to introduce you to medical aid in dying. And then I'm going to put some content around it in terms of a slideshow. But I want to start with the stories, if you don't mind. First thing I want to say is I, I'm impressed by your courage to sign up for this kind of presentation. The conversation about death and dying is an uncomfortable one. And those of us who are 70 plus are closer to it than the rest of you. Um, this is a reality, obviously, that we all will face. So thank you for opening your minds and your hearts uh, in the beginning of this conversation. Um, the story I wanna tell you is about a client in Washington state. I'll change enough of the data so that she has her confidentiality protected. You understand that I'm sure. Um, in Washington state, we have volunteers spread out across the state and a central office where patients or clients can call into and say, I want to see if I qualify for medical aid in dying. Um, and what happens is geographically, a volunteer is assigned to that patient. And then we go help them navigate the law to see if they're eligible and help walk them through that. I got a call one day from a woman out in one of the islands out in the western part, northwestern part of Washington state um, from her husband actually said that she wanted to have a consult with a volunteer and uh, could I come out and visit? Um, these are the delightful ch chances for volunteers because we get to take beautiful ferry rides across San Juan Islands and out into these magnificent islands. Um, and I arrived at their home and the husband was at the front door and he opened the door, pushed his way out and shut the door outside. We were standing outside and he said, I want you to know, I don't agree with her decision. And um, I said, okay, but can we talk about that? I wanna hear where you're coming from. So we stood out on the stoop for probably 15 or 20 minutes. And he was very clear for religious reasons that he did not support the medical aid in dying nor his wife's choice for that, to use that law. He, my job, and you all know this because of your natural proclivity is to listen until he felt understood. And I think this was the first time he had a chance to actually talk about in depth without getting cut off by somebody about why he didn't support it. And uh, it was totally legitimate point of view. I mean, this is the beauty of choice is you get to make choices. Um, he kind of got done talking and said, well, I guess it's time for you to come and meet my wife. So he took me into a, kind of a den area in his house. And physically what I was met with was, if you remember some of the pictures of Stephen Hawking 
in, in the days when he was doing some of his final lectures. Um, this woman had Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and it affects musculature and nerve systems so that you are in a position of not being able to slowly move, swallow, talk, eat. Um, and luckily she had a computer system, which was terrific where with one finger, she could type out letters so she and I could communicate. Um, she was crystal clear in her thinking. Um, she understood the law. She said, I want to be this to be um, in effect as soon as we could. Um, she was, she did not address her husband's concerns. He sat in the back of the room with his arms crossed during the whole time I was with her. She had two daughters who did support her. Um, first step in this process is to get two physicians who are willing to testify to the fact that she had a six month terminal illness and was competent to take the medication, mentally competent. Um, we got those doctors for her. One of them said that he did not believe she was eligible because she didn't have the capacity, he didn't think, to fill her feeding tube on her own. Because of her advanced stage of ALS, she was not capable of swallowing the medication, so it had to be injected into her feeding tube, but she had to be the one who actually pushed the syringe with the medication. The physician did not believe she had the capacity. I negotiated with him and said, if, you, if I do a trial with her, will you be willing, and, it, and it's successful, would you be willing to change your mind about your diagnosis? He agreed to that. I went back out to the home the next, early the next week, and we filled her syringe with a normal uh, solution for feeding. And with amazing amount of courage, this woman put both of her arms on top of the syringe, her husband held the tube itself and she depressed the syringe appropriately. She was able to get all the medic, not the medication, her food into her stomach, proving that she had the capacity at that point to self-medicate. She said, did I pass? <laughs> and I, I said, well, let me call the doc. And I said, we have good relationships obviously with these physicians and I called Sadly, his name is Dr. Graves, and uh, he, he actually has fun with that name, but um, I called him and I said, we just finished the trial and she was successful. He said, go, you got my go ahead. If you wanted to die the next day, um, that's, you'll see it later on from the law's perspective, not possible. There's a 24 hour waiting period from the time that she gets the go ahead to when she can actually get the medication from the pharmacy. So we had to wait a couple of days for that. Um, she set the time, she got her daughters to fly out. Um, the husband and I talked probably two or three more times on the phone in between about his concerns. He said he, that he recognized it was his wife's choice on this um, and that he could not physically be in the room when she died. Um, that by the way is not abnormal. There are people given their own proclivities who can be present and others who cannot be. Um, normal course of affairs is the volunteer picks up the medication from the pharmacy and then mixes it for the patient. It's difficult for family members to feel like they're part of either buying or purchasing and picking up and mixing medication for their dad or their grandma. We assembled around her bed. Um, I filled the syringe in the kitchen and brought it to her. And remember that we can't help her administer this medication. So her daughter held, again, held the feeding tube. She had weakened, actually it was hard to imagine this, but she'd weakened since the trial three days earlier. But she still went through the same process. And I think she actually put her chin on her arms as she depressed the plunger for the medication to go into her stomach. Um, this woman was so frail that she went asleep in two minutes and she died in seven minutes. These are, these are very quick times. The normal time is five minutes to you sleep in a coma and up to an hour plus before medication 
uh, helped she die. But she was clearly ready to die. She was confident about this. Her daughters were very appropriate. I noticed in the middle of the process where she was plunging, pressing the plunger that a husband actually came in. <laughs> yeah, he came in from a living room and sat with her in the, in the side of the bed. Um, I'm not sure she was aware of that, but I think it was to his credit. Um, death is very peaceful in these situations. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, and she, her whole body just relaxed. The physiological tension of ALS is such where you, you just look like your, every, every nerve muscle is in a cramp. And at death, she just simply spread out a little bit on her bed and the pillow and was totally relaxed. And our daughters were, were thankful and um, then we went on from there. So I wanted to start with that story to give you a, uh, an example of what a death is like. I've had the honor and the privilege of attending over 50 of these deaths over the set last seven years. Um, and it was, except for the feeding tomb piece, most people are able to swallow, it was much like this in the sense that there's usually a family member who's not supportive. And then there's uh, great support and comfort on the part of the patient themselves. This is, a, this is a peaceful process for them. There isn't a trauma involved and, and most of their family members. So Ron, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and put the slideshow up and follow that. Um, and then we'll take questions at the end. How does that sound? That's perfect. Okay, so we'll just start with this. Um, here's what I'm gonna do in terms of the presentation. I apologize for this, but it's easier to capture some information uh, in print. Uh, talk a little bit about six options. We all have six choices in how we die. So uh, you'll be interested in knowing about those. Brief statistics from Washington about the Death with Dignity Act itself. will present some moral dilemmas. Um, Humanists and Unitarians like moral dilemmas. We have lots of fun talking about those. So um, those are important. And then we'll do question and answers. I want you to take a minute to think about <clears throat> yourselves and imagine yourself in the last hour of your own life. Um, if you can get a picture of where you are, literally what's the setting, who's with you, what are some of the noises, smells, sounds, feelings that you have? Transport yourself to that last hour of your own life and get a picture. So I'd like to be able to talk to each of you about this picture because this is a vibrant piece of our lives. I'm going to need, I apologize, but need to summarize kind of what people normally say about this. So I hope I capture what individually you were thinking. Uh, most of us would like to be at home with loved ones. We don't want to be in hospitals. We don't want to hear compressors going on, cardiac machines, respirators. We don't want to be hooked into too many tubes. We'd like our pain, discomfort managed. We want our spiritual needs be, to be respected, whatever those are. And we really don't want to be a burden on the people around us. My assumption is that fit pretty well with what you saw for your last hour. Sometimes even if I stand in the middle of the room, no one acknowledges me. This is the proverbial elephant in the room. Death is like this. It's very difficult to talk about death with folks. My wife and I got to be kind of known as the death couple. People had people come over for dinner parties at our house. We'd have lovely dinner. And then we'd ask them, what are their plans for dying? This is a very odd conversation to have at a dinner party. Um, but interestingly, people, as I'm sure you do, get into it. They, they want to think about this. They want support to have uh, conversations about it. But still in our society, it's the elephant in the room. 
Jennifer Glass died at age 52. She was a proponent in California when we were getting the law passed back in 2015. She said very prosaically, I'm doing everything I can to extend my life, but no one has the right to prolong my death. Jerry Brown, when he signed the law in Gal Jerry Brown, you may remember, was a, a, a priest. I'm trying to, I think he was a Jesuit priest originally. Um, said in signing the law of California that while it was difficult for him as a topic, he had no right to prevent others from making this choice. I'm sure you know by now that Arizona does not have this law in place. Nine other states do in the District of Columbia. Here are the six treatment options that we have at the end of our lives. Um, one thing we can do is to tackle and accept all treatment interventions chemotherapy, surgery, medical infusion, um, radiation, uh, solutions from different countries. I've heard frequently of people going to Mexico because there's the recent cure for prostate cancer or lung cancer. Uh, this is a reasonable choice on people's part to say, I wanna live and I'm gonna do everything I can to make that happen. At some point, that may not work anymore. And at some point, even doctors will say, I'm sorry, it's just not a good idea to keep choosing that particular option. The second end of life option is the opposite of that, is to say, I'm done. No more. Um, this is not a comfortable statement for medical people to hear because they have been trained to, to keep people alive and to heal, to heal them. But as patients, at any point in our lives, we have the right to say no more treatment. And for people who have six month terminal illnesses, the illness will catch up to them relatively soon. I guess is at least half of you have had some sort of experience with hospice, which is the third choice. Usually that experience is good. They're, they're a really nice job across the board with not only the treatment of uh, end stage uh, disease, but also uh, social work, uh, clerical support, um, and then an incredible volunteer source too. Ron, you told me that you were connected to hospice in the past. So uh, my guess, my hope is that you had a good experience in doing that. The next choice is a combination of what's called palliative care and sedation. Palliative care is an ongoing process. Anytime we take Tylenol, we're doing some version of palliative care. Hospital-based palliative care is pe keeping people out of pain and misery and anxiety. Uh, it's, it's a normal part of disease management. So if you're go undergoing chemotherapy, for example, the anti-nausea medications you take is part of your palliative care. A palliative sedation is a different uh, degree of this. Palliative sedation is usually made in an inpatient setting of some sort hospital, nursing home, with a team of physicians and your family that basically are saying, there's nothing more we can do with grandpa. And so let's put him into a deep sleep, keep him comfortable until the natural disease state takes his life. He's sedated to the point of non-recognition. And this is because there's some, some nasty cancers, particularly um, that have pain that is not able to be managed by morphines and, and the other medications. So really putting somebody into a coma is the right thing to do until the disease state takes them out. That's the palliative sedation version. The fifth choice is voluntary stopping eating and drinking. This choice is the one that my father made. Um, he was a longtime Unitarian, a member of the Hemlock Society. Um, he used to walk around his uh, assisted living place doing lectures on end of life care. So he had a lifetime of 93 years of wonderful uh, success and optimism. In the 94th year of his life, he developed a failure to thrive. And he called me and he said, I need you out here to be my coach because I'm gonna stop eating and drinking. The, the home that he was in, the nursing staff all wanted him obviously to stay alive. So they wanted to put pick lines in for him. They had already started thickening his soup with that thickener they use so you can swallow it. And he said, I'm not doing this anymore. So come on out here. Um, I ended up coming out. I was in Washington State at the time. He was in Pennsylvania. 
I ended up being more of a linebacker than a coach because there were all kinds of meaningful people who wanted to do, wanted to feed him, keep him alive. One poignant moment, if you'll indulge me on this, was the second night after he declared on the record in his chart with the doctors and the nursing staff that he's going to stop eating and drinking, a nurse came in with a vanilla ice cream cone, and he was famous for his love of ice cream. And she came into his room in this, you know, semi-sleepy state he's in, brought the ice, and I was sitting behind the bed. She got into the room and he's looking at this ice cream and he, and he wanted it. He wanted to have it. And you can imagine he did. He was dry as could be. He was hungry. And I got up and I'm 6'4". I stood next to her at the bed. I said, my father has been very clear about this. She said, I can't refuse food to patients who indicate that they want it. And of course, he's nodding his head at this time. He wants this ice cream. So we stood there for a minute and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give it to him after you leave. And she looked at me and I looked at her and we knew what we were doing here. She knew that I was not going to give it to him, but she knew that she had fulfilled her obligation as a professional. So she handed me the ice cream, walked out of the room and I threw it in the garbage. My father died three days later um, voluntary stopping eating and drinking is not a comfortable way to die. So if there are other choices that we have, we want to choose them, not this one. And the sixth choice we have, end of life option, is medical aid and dying. And I'm going to give you a little bit more detail that will flesh out the story I told you of the client. So if you have questions about this, make a note of them or, or write it in the chat box and, and we can address them uh, toward the end of this slideshow. Some quick statistics. Um, of the nine states that are using this, the statistics are relatively the same. There is somewhere between 140 to 160 people who use the medication in each year in each of these states. Average time to death, 1.2. Most of us are over 65. 65 to 70 percent of us have cancer. The others are uh, other, other disease states. The primary reason people say they choose this is uh, they, they've lost their autonomy and they hate that. Um, there's also a lack of dignity that occurs at this stage of life in terms of uh, bowel movements and eating and regurgitation. And we just simply don't sign up for this, even in the greatest of, of marriages and life. Most people we encourage to enroll in hospice because hospice, while they, their job is not to have people die, their job is to keep them comfortable while they die. Um, it's terrific support in terms of beds, bed sores, uh, spiritual life, uh, and the medication uh, to keep them comfortable. You cannot be in hospice if you are actively pursuing treatment to cure your illness. That's one of the main distinctions between when you become eligible for hospice, six months diagnosis, and no longer pursuing remedial treatment. And in all of the years since Oregon passed this law 20 plus years ago, there's been no instances of abuse. So we're not, there's no granny panels here. Uh, we're not putting people down that, uh, because we want their inheritance. You've got six months, but with aggressive treatment, we can help make that seem much longer. So, yeah, this is a state. I don't want to be this guy on the gurney, I can tell you. I really just don't want to be him. Um, again, uh, we have two physicians, Dr. Fish and Dr. Fischler, on our, on our board. And they say that it's the doctors. The doctors have simply not been trained to speak with and talk to and listen to people in the end stage for dying. They just never got any training. In it. It's not that it's their fault. They just haven't got any training. And as you know, because you're compassionate and empathic people, having these conversations is emotionally difficult. <clears throat> not to speak of the fact that in a six month, sorry, in a six minute time that you have with each patient in a clinic, you can't delve into emotions because they take longer. They just take longer to have these conversations. So let's hope we're not this guy on the, on the gurney. 
Here's the formal definition of death with dignity. The, take a read of this, I don't need to read to you. The, in red are the requirements of the laws across the country that have these, uh, this in place. When a patient is deemed to be eligible for the law, this is the timeline that they need to follow. They make a first request to any physician to put into their charts that they wanna use the medical aid in dying choice. Even if a doctor does not support the law, they are required to note the chart that the patient made the request to die. Once that first request has been made, we help them find two physicians called the attending physician who writes the prescription and the consulting physician who backs it up. They have two weeks, no, no, no shorter than that, to have appointments with those doctors, for those doctors to determine if they have a six month terminal illness and if they are mentally competent to make decisions. After that time has gone by, they, a second request is made. That's again, a verbal request that's put in the chart. And a written request is made at the same time, signed by two folks and submitted to the attending physician, testing to the mental competence of the patient. Then there's a 48 hour waiting period after that time when the prescription is written and is available in the pharmacy. The rationale for this basically it's a 17th day uh, period, is so that people do not impulsively walk into a doctor's office and say, I'm, I don't like my life, write me the script and I'll take it this afternoon. It's not like antibiotics. There has to be a reasoned delay, if you will, uh, in the timeline. I hope that uh, my pace is okay with you. I'm not going either too fast or slow. Uh, quick things that you probably have gleaned already. It's a voluntary process. As you know from the story, self-administration, most people swallow it. Two physicians need to determine capacity. <coughs> Occasionally what happens is a physician will not be sure that the patient has the mental ability to make decisions and they'll refer that patient to somebody like me. I'm a PhD licensed psychologist or a psychiatrist. And our job is to make a determination and assessment of the mental competence. Usually these assessments, I've done about, I think three or four of them uh, in the last number of years. They're relatively easy because uh, in one case I visited with a man in a long-term care facility and we start off with the basic questions. What day of the week is it? Uh, where are you? Who's the president of the United States? And this guy was not able to answer any of those questions. So it was very clear that his ability to make complex medical decisions did not exist. So he was ineligible for the law. Um, most, the, the other three patients that I uh, did assessments with and the norm is that they're lucid as can be. Um, they're, they've given this a lot of thought. They've tried lots of choices. They probably have tried medical interventions of various sorts. Um, and they understand their disease state and what this medication will do to them. The doctor then confirms that they're qualified and that they're not under undue influence. The medication process itself is an hour before the patient takes the medication, we give them anti-nausea medication. In about 5% of the cases, they throw up the medication. Interestingly enough, the medication is strong enough that even in those cases, the patient dies. So the, whatever they retained from aspirating that or from throwing that up, that was still enough to have them die in a peaceful manner. The medications are a compound of morphine, propanolol, valium, and digoxin. Um, both of those are a combination of respiratory and cardiac medications. <clears throat> As a volunteer or a family member, normally we mix this into about a quarter of a cup of liquid. The uh, preferred method right now is vodka. Folks like to go out smiling. So it, even if they use Gatorade or Tang or something like that, they, we, we recommend a chaser, what we call a chaser to clean their palate. And that's everything from, again, vodka for some reason, uh, red wine, 
nice scotch that they've been saving um, because they have about a five minute uh, window before they fall asleep. And that will be their last memory, that deep, deep sleep, um, uh, calm and uh, quiet. And then death averages around an hour plus. Wills, contracts, insurance, annuities are not affected by this. What appears on your death certificate is the, the uh, disease state, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, not medical aid in dying. So there's no problem uh, from a legal standpoint. And I wanna show you a slide next about the idea about this, is this suicide or assisted suicide? Our opposition here from a group that you I'm sure love, the, the CAP, Center for Arizona Policy, uh, is our main opposition, and they can continue to believe that this is physician-assisted suicide. Um, when I was doing my PhD work, we did a number of internships, and I had an internship on a, a suicide hotline, uh, and I got the night shift for, uh, I think it was a three-month internship. And so I had some success and some failure in talking people who, uh, down from suicidal uh, ideation. And I can tell you right now that I have never seen two psychological states that are so diametrically opposed than the state that somebody is in medical aid and dying and the state that people are in at a suicidal moment. Take a look at this list. Again, I'm not gonna read it to you. But get a sense of flavor about the difference, both intellectually, conceptually, and emotionally the difference between medical aid and dying and suicide. When people ask what it's like to be present um, with people who take medication, I say it's an honor. There's a quiet nobility to it. Um, they folks have spent days, weeks saying goodbye telling stories, um, reassuring people. Um, one guy, after he took the medication, knew he had less than five minutes before he went to sleep, said, smiled at his family, said, I'll see you all on the other side. And that was perfect for them from their own spiritual beliefs and uh, was exactly what he needed to say before he left. Alex, so here's a couple of them, a couple of slides from being finished. Then we'll do question and answer. Uh, things that you could do on your own. Talk to your physicians now. Most of us who are tend to be a little older have at least three or four physicians, oncologists, cardiologists, family physicians, dermatologists, and let them know that you support medical aid and dying and ask if they do. I'm going to guess that half of them don't know what you're talking about. So that's an opportunity to get them some literature. Some of them are gonna say, well, I'm not sure. I might do it for my own patients, but I'm not gonna do it as a walk-in clinic. Okay, that's a choice. Um, you might think that if none of your physicians support this, you might think about changing physicians. I had to do that in Washington State because I need a physician who is willing to do to write me a script. Um, you don't wanna be at this point in your life and not have anybody there to support you. Uh, call your legislator. All of you are good at this. You know how this works. Uh, the more voices they hear from their constituents about your support of this law, which will be dropped in January, this coming January, uh, the better. We have a campaign going right now called the Seven Touches, where we are contacting every legislator over the last seven months, once a month, and their staffers and their challengers because of the election year. You can hold virtual house parties. Uh, as I said, there are three, quote, three docs, myself, um, two other docs who can do a presentation like this in a virtual house party. <clears throat> Excuse me, invite your friends, ask one of our speakers, share the information. And I'm sure you have extra time for volunteering. We have a particular need for uh, information technology expertise and for expertise uh, contacting the press, radios, uh, newspapers, um, and if you have some of that expertise or not, just give us a shout on our website. Um, moral dilemmas. If you would like to talk with some of these during the question and answer, that would be perfect. 
people talk about, is this fit with my religion? Uh, what if one of my children balks at a decision? As I said earlier, there's usually one family member somewhere who appears and doesn't support it. What happens if dementia takes over? And we can talk about that if you'd like. And then the whole question of when do I know, how do I know when to take this medication? It's very odd if you think about it to say, oh yeah, I think noon when, next Wednesday would be a good time. Um, that's a tough decision for both the patient as well as the family. Here's the, our contact information website is azendoflifeoptions.org. And if you'd like to call me directly, you feel free to do that. Okay, I'll leave this up for another two seconds and then I'm gonna, Ron, if it's okay, I'm gonna get rid of this and uh, we can have question and answer. Absolutely. Uh, again, if you would like to raise your hand to ask a question, uh, or I will read the questions that are uh, have been asked in chat. Uh, first up from Sherry, uh, to confirm you do this service at assisted living. Ah, great question, Sherry. So assisted living have different policies as to whether they allow it or not. In the states that allow it, my, my experience is about half of assisted living facilities say yes, that they're their guests is what they call them normally, or their clients have the right because of the literally the lease for the room. They have the right to do what they want in that room. The other half say, no, they do not have permission to do it. In those cases, when it's the choice of the patient, we have to actually remove them from that living facility, take them back home for an afternoon where they take the medication book them a hotel nearby so that they can legally do it without without violating the assisted living policy. Um, someone asked, uh, I heard that hospice doesn't give enough uh, pain meds due to addiction. Is this true? That's not true. Uh, hospice is uh, very conscientious about keeping people pain-free in the last months of their lives. Um, they do not take it to the level of coma or death. They're not in the business of that. But they're, they're very, um, I would say, uh, scientifically based of managing both with, with all of the choices of opiates as well as morphine. Uh, well, Francis is waving his hand at you, Don. Ron, I don't know where you are. In oh, that. okay. I'm not, I'm not able to see everybody's know, frame because of the presentation. That. Go ahead, Francis. Well, this is actually Joel and Francis, my spouse is here with me. The question I have uh, in association with the final exit network, they are very concerned about what they call the dementia provision uh, within the final directors. In other words, I make out my directors today, and if I deteriorate through Alzheimer's or dementia, some legal or the hospital institutions would say, I'm not the same person who made the decision four or five months ago, years ago, and they refuse then to honor the final director. Do you have any comments upon that? Yeah, uh, two things. The, what, I'm sorry, it's not Francis, it's Joe, is it? Yes, I'm Joel and spouse Francis is here. With so, so thank you. Uh, is talking about is the final exit network um, in here in Arizona. They, they have an office run out of Tucson. Um, the final exit is a different approach to ending your life with some dignity. And I encourage you to make contact with them. Um, there's a book called The Final Exit, which is a, a starter place. Um, we do we have a understanding with one another, but we do not cross paths because the bill that we we are interested in dropping or will drop um, does not include the approach that they use. Now, the second part of your question, Joel, is the whole dementia dement, uh, dementia dimension. Um, you have to be a mental and sound mind in order to be eligible for this law so that it is occasionally happened where somebody begins the process and they are of sound mind, but because of moving into second or third stage dementia, 
during the waiting period, they no longer are eligible. This is a nut we have not figured out how to crack. It's a weakness in the system of helping people die with dignity. You can't pay it forward in this situation. You can't say like you do in an advanced directive, if I get to that stage, then please somebody feed me the medication. That's, no, that's not a legal option at this point. I'm, I'm, I regret saying that, but that's, that's the, the current situation in the United States. Different countries have different solutions for that. They're more liberal in helping somebody who are in the first stages of dementia follow their wishes. Uh, one of the other questions is, um, this is more of a comment from Austin. Uh, I can see how a strong patient-physician relationship is needed to have this conversation. In my opinion, much of your health decisions in the U.S. are transactional and not suitable for these holistic health discussions. Um, your musings on this are welcome, doctor. And I, I also add, how are we training and re-educating doctors to have these conversations? Uh, well, the good news is yesterday with a conversation with Dr. Fitch, who was a palliative care and, uh, and oncologist with Mayo Clinic until he retired last year, said that medical schools are now dealing with this issue. Uh, there is a field now called gerontology that did not exist when he was going through his training. Uh, even, even rookie MDs are being exposed to classes in actual classes in empathy. So... <laughs> If you imagine your next doctor's appointment and your doctor had the class on, so how are you feeling, Ron? Um, one, of the, one of the admonitions that Dr. Finch used, which is really interesting, is he said, next time you go talk to your doctor, don't talk about what's painful. Don't talk about your physical situation and see what he does or she does. Because it forces them to say, well, how are you? And then you can say, well, you know, I've been really cooped up with this COVID-19 thing. thing. I don't like it. I'm, I'm lonely. I'm getting on my wife's nerves. Um, he, because his point is, if you walk in and start talking about your, you know, your bum knee, then you become transactional and you become, and the doctor becomes very specific in what she or he is paying attention to. So those are my musings. I tend not to muse much, but. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Sherry mentioned that her mother died uh, with nitrogen with the help of Death and Dignity Service. Um, I would also like to state that uh, my mom passed away in May 2019 and was denied uh, Death and Dignity options from her hospice provider due to religious uh, beliefs. Uh, she had for years and years said, hey, this is how I want to go out when I get to this point. Uh, but that was removed from her because her hospice would stop refusing care uh, were she to go down that road. So I'm looking forward to uh, better options for yeah. us here in Arizona. Ron, where was your mother at the time of her death? Colorado and at home. Oh, so Colorado does have the law. So why was she denied that? So uh, the hospice provider would not engage with a death with dignity options, even though that was a legal piece. Their medical doctors would not support that and would uh, no longer allow her to be on hospice were she to uh, pursue that. I, I, uh, I'm really sorry for that. Um, it, it doesn't need to be that way. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent in the hospice director's office trying to negotiate this in Washington state. We have two hospices that serve our particular counties. One is a Catholic owned and based hospice. So they won't even actually talk about this as a choice to any of their patients. They refer them. Uh, the other one is not. So they are marvelously open. We, we, they have patients in their own hospice care that take the medication on site. So it really depends on the philosophic and or political position those institutions are taking. And I'm sorry your mom was in that particular one. Me too. Um, so uh, another question, uh, how can we get a copy of your slides or, or this information? Uh, you're recording this, aren't you? Yes, we are. <laughs> so tell, tell them how you're going to do it. 
<laughs> uh, you can check it out on YouTube. All of the slides and all of the presentation are there. Um, if there is a, uh, a way that you want to just stop and, and pause it and just click through so you can see all the slides and don't have to listen to the speaking if you're looking for a particular piece of information, uh, that is what I would uh, recommend for that. Yeah. Ron, I'm pretty stupid about YouTube. So what would I, when I open up YouTube, what would I type in? To find yeah, it? type in uh, Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. And that will take you to our place on YouTube. And then you find the uh, session that you want to, to look at, uh, which would be uh, your session. And you'd start it and then you would pause it and then just click along the timeline uh, on the bottom of the video. And you will be able to jump to whatever timeline you want. And you'll see the screen there uh, Great. for that presentation. Yep. And does that take a couple of days to upload or something? Or is it no, it's live right now. Actually, we're pro it's going to YouTube and it'll be up at the end of this session. So you're oh, good. <laughs> magic. Thank you. Well, yeah. Um, I got a, another one from Chip here. Uh, we got a by the time you read this letter from dad, uh, surviving second life advanced cancer. She went to Oregon and had and all that we had was that postmark. The lack of location or even a date of death was a source of pain within the family for a long time. Please comment on the privacy versus sharing a date so that uh, it has finality and closure. And is there a reporting requirement? No, Ron, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could, could you help me? Uh, so uh, someone went to Oregon and passed, sent a letter back to their family. Um, and that was a source of pain for the family without knowing that this was going to happen? Uh, is there any kind of a, the patient has to communicate with anybody? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm understanding the question and I don't want to get too far. I'm assuming that the patient went to Oregon and used the medical aid in dying law there. Um, and, but had not previously communicated with the particular family members that that was her or his intent. So this was a surprise when they found out of the death about the death later. That, that's my understanding of the question. That's my understanding as well. And Chip's not here to uh, elaborate. So, <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm sure most of us will draw the same conclusion about this. Is that this really speaks beautifully to the idea of let's start these conversations now, so that we don't we are in a position to not have to go off to Oregon by ourselves without telling anybody. And notifying them later. I mean that that speaks to the quality and the frequency of communication about mom or dad's wishes prior to getting too far toward the end. Um, it's critical to have these conversations. And and what couple of things I know about them is they don't happen in one city. So when you when you decide to bring it up with your dad or mom or those of us who are older with our kids, expect to have this over a two or three month period of time and come back to it two or three, four times because you get kind of tired and, and emotionally drained, drained from the conversation. So the first conversation could be 10 to 15 minutes and the second one the same amount of time and not tackle it all in the same city. It's, it's just too much emotionally in my experience. Um, there is no obligation of death with dignity to notify the family of death. This is a HIPAA concern, as you would expect. So that would actually be a violation of HIPAA, um, in that it's a medical it's a medical procedure. Um, I have a question. How does um, this interact, or does it at all interact with uh, the COVID situation and people refusing uh, to be put on ventilators or anything like that? Yeah, good question. So let's, uh, um, one of the treatment options is no treatment. So the refusal to be on a ventilator is that choice. I'm not, you'll keep me on oxygen maybe through my nose, but I don't want to go to the ventilator route. And if I die as a result of that, that's my choice. Anybody can make that right now in any of our hospitals in this state. Because we don't have the law here, um, we can't really use it, but in Washington state that does have the law, COVID is killing people faster than we have time within the timeline of the death with dignity law. 
So if you once you get those symptoms of COVID in your and it's a full blown case, you you may die within two a two week period or less. And so while while we have some patients who have COVID who are trying to get through that 17 day timeline that I presented, it's so far failed. With there hasn't been enough time. And the other thing is that when you are hooked to a, a respirator you no longer can self-administer. And the, the doctors in the hospital who are taking care of your COVID aren't gonna inject this in a PIC line or, or saline solution. So it's a very uncomfortable and awkward time to try to overlap these or mix these two uh, approaches. You could, um, you could refuse treatment, right? That's right. the option uh, yes. and request palliative care. Yes. Exactly. And, and, and for those of, who are in last stages, like the last two days of COVID, they can request palliative sedation. And then death will come very quickly because the respiratory system will shut down very fast with palliative sedation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does a doctor have to pronounce death for a death certificate? No. Hospice nurses can do it. Um, uh, some some uh, nurse, yeah. Uh, and so the answer is no. Perfect. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about reframing that palliative care piece that you talked about. You referenced Tylenol as palliative care. Um, can you expand on that and what palliative <laughs> care is? Because because it's it's true. I mean, every cold medicine we take is palliative care. Um, we're all a patient of the human condition doing palliative measures, just not within that six month window, right? Um, well, Ron, you ought to talk about this because you have experience with this in your hospice years. Uh, there's a continuum of palliative intervention. So why don't you talk about this? You're better qualified than I am. No, no, no. This is your session. Okay. All right. <laughs> I just want to, you know, acknowledge expertise where it exists. Yeah. Um, so there's a continuum. Uh, and when you think about palliative care or any kind of care, there's very low key interventions. And that's why I use Tylenol for a headache um, to fentanyl. If your pain is intractable with pancreatic cancer, the huge spread between those two interventions, but it's the same concept. We're trying to keep people out of pain and have them not be anxious from a mental health standpoint. And whatever medications are appropriate, and by the way, we don't necessarily know that when we start. You might start on a particular kind of uh, fentanyl and it's just not gonna work. So you have to go, go to something else. Morphine is the normal place to start for pain or the, uh, the oxycodines, that whole family but it doesn't work for all patients. And so you shift it, you increase it, you decrease it, you, so on and so forth. Um, all of that's palliative care because the concern, and it really is a humanist concern from, from everybody's standpoint. Uh, we're caring for this human being. We don't want them to be in pain. We don't want them to be afraid. And I can tell you most people who are in pain are also very afraid. It's lonely. It, you feel don't feel understood because who can understand? And you don't want other people to feel to, to understand what you're going through or to feel that pain. So it's it's the appropriate measure level of care based on the need of the patient. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so your father was an end of life proponent and now you're doing this. You have dinner parties where you have these difficult conversations. Uh, for those of us who aren't usually having these conversations, is there any advice you could give us that would help us bridge that gap and, and approach that difficult conversation with my kids, right? I'm, I'm going to have this conversation with my kids at some point. And right. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so all 44 of you or 46 of us today saw part of this presentation. It's a perfect opening line. The next over dinner or breakfast or on a walk, you know, I was plugged into the Zoom meeting and it was about death and dying. And uh, honey, do you ever think about that? Your mom and I are 72 years old, we're getting old. Um, 
Have we shared very much with you about our wishes and what, what's gonna happen in the next years? I would, I would start with open-ended questions. That's maybe because I'm a psychologist, but anyway, that's a good way to start because then you find out what other people think first and that helps you gear how you respond. Um, all of us probably are thinking about, if we already have it, an advanced directive of some sort, a living will that stipulates, clears, or clarifies for people what we want uh, if we are under, if we get taken to the hospital or whatever. Um, sharing that with your family, having your family help you fill it out in the first place. Um, all of those things work. And once you start the conversation, it usually is pretty easy to keep it going in my experience. But again, remember, it's going to be a multiple set of conversations, not just one city. So I've got a uh, comment from Post DL Post. Uh, my mother has signed all the papers and she was comatose, but she was in Wisconsin that has no such law. I was there with one sister. The doctor said that we, the doctors, do not have to abide by your mother's wishes, though they were written down. Uh, does all of your family agree? Of the five living children, four agreed. The one who was not there, uh, the one who didn't wasn't there. So Janet and I said, yes, we all agree. So the doctor pulled the plug. That way, if there was a lawsuit, the doctor could not be blamed because it was Janet and I who had lied. But there was no lawsuit. Fortunately, I think my brother would be silly enough, wouldn't be silly enough to sue me. <laughs> yeah, don't sue a lawyer. Uh, that's, that's a good good rule. Um, any Any comments on that yeah they're very smart on their part to to tell the immediate truth which is yeah everybody everybody that's here is, is supportive of this um physicians will change not sorry physicians will not abide with the advanced directive if they believe there is family disagreement and that's a legal position they take because they don't they don't want to get sued so they got, it's easier for them to say, sorry, until you guys come to an agreement, we're not pulling the plug. We're not doing anything wrong. Um, so they manage that perfectly. Excellent, excellent. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Is anybody raising their hand that I don't see on the video? Um, Checking, checking. Uh, Anita, Anita. Anita. Go, Anita. And then Sherry, you're next. Yeah, I'm just wondering for future. Um, how is, uh, I'm sorry, dementia or the onset of dementia diagnosed? Can you uh, answer that? Yeah, no, there's a very clear protocol in the neurology field for a series of questions and tests to diagnose the levels of dementia. Um, I don't know how old you are, Anita, but it, once you get to be 65 or older, there's a mental test that we have to do every year for our social security. And some of you may have already experienced that. They ask you to remember uh, four words and then they change the topic and then they come back and say, what were the four words and count backwards from a hundred by seven. Um, these are, these are samples, examples of the protocol, testing protocol that are used by neurologists to determine levels of dementia. Well, I'm 72, my husband's 83, and he's the one I'm really concerned about. But as far as that test, I wouldn't be able to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the trick, when they ask you to count backward by seven, subtract 10 and add three in your brain. It's much easier to do it that way. Okay. So Sherry, I think uh, Ron had a question. Thank you. And Sherry, you're on mute still, so we won't be able to hear you. I'm going to go to your website to um, so I so I can volunteer. Bless you, my child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because of my mother's experience. Yeah, I'm, that would sound as bad. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, uh, it, it, 
you mentioned earlier that it was an honor for you to be around people during this dying process. And I would echo that. It is uh, one of, it, it sounds strange that it's the highlight to be able to be there for someone during this very um, intimate process and hear these stories and to uh, really uh, connect with people around these, these things. And um, I would encourage people to lean into this process and, and view it with empathy and compassion and, and do what you can. It's uh, emotionally draining, but well worth the work. <laughs> Ron, thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate the time your, your organization has given to this. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, any other questions before we wrap it up for the day? And I am not on my chat window, so hold on. <laughs> uh, Philip has his hand up. Philip, go, Philip. More, more of a statement than a question, and just that it troubles me a lot. That uh, several years ago, I went looking for uh, uh, a care place, and and several of the places I visited. Uh, there were people sitting in um, in folding lawn chairs, watching some inane thing on television, and and terrible stench of urine. And it wasn't until some time later that I realized the reason they were in folding lawn chairs was that those were easy for the staff to hose down later on to clean them. And, and the fact that we're celebrating a legislation, a, a proposed legislation that would not address that problem that would force those people just because they're not any longer able to make the decision real time would force those people to spend years sitting in their own urine uh, troubles me a lot. It seems very inhumane. Yeah, Philip, thank you for your concern about those folks. I, I this is. A, a uh, loophole in the law, we, we not covering those kinds of folks, the demented folks. Um, and it's a great sadness for me to, um, to realize that we're, we're leaving them out of the formula at this point. So um, resources for, for us. So you, you had mentioned if we didn't have a doctor or, or someone that supported death with dignity, uh, are there resources that we can look up, uh, doctors that do support this, people that we can get engaged with that do support this, uh, this line of work? Uh, two answers for you on this one, Ron. Um, you can call me at any point with any kind of question about this law or the nine other states um, or your cir personal circumstance around it. Um, in order to use the law, you have to move to a state that has the law in effect. And that's possible. Um, we, we, we don't invite, but we, in Washington state, we have, make allowances for and take care of folks who move up there. It's relatively easy to establish residence. And then our volunteer folks will help you find a doctor. Um, California, it's the, the same way, but they're, they're struggling um, as is uh, New Jersey and a couple of the other places, but you can move. And they're also uh, in, in another choice is the extreme uh, choice of going to either Switzerland or Belgium, which has a, an organization called Dignitas from the term word dignity. Um, and for a uh, fee, you can, if you're eligible, you can be euthanized. And that means you literally are injected by pharmaceuticals to die with dignity. So that's an international choice, but it's for the one percenters or maybe the five percenters because of the cost of getting there and then paying the fee. Okay. Well, uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap this up? Um, I'm going to go on the Humanist website and see whether there's a space for me with you all. Thank you. There is certainly space for you with us all. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, 
Oh, one more thing. Uh, Austin B., are there any organizations on the periphery of this work that look at geriatric care as a whole and changing it for the better in the U.S.? Uh, I, I don't know the names of them, but I'm sure there are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anita, Anita, I think, has the final question. Go, Anita. Okay, I'm back. Um, I just thought of this. I have a, an acquaintance who is a quadriplegic, and she just recently, I just recently read her book about the story of her life. Um, not, this is not, this question is not specifically for her, but what about somebody who is quadriplegic and, and cannot, you know, press the plunger? What would, you know, how would, this is something people don't think about much. And she has made me very, very aware of the, the plight of the disabled. Yeah, um, as you would imagine, Anita, all of us in this work are very careful about how we are treating the dis disability and disabled. Um, the first problem she has is that she's not eligible law because she does not have a six month terminal diagnosis. That prevents her from even getting in the ballpark, having the discussion. Um, now, at some point she will decline as all of us will um, and if well, I'm sorry, excuse me. This is not specifically for her. I'm just talking in general because she is very active. She is not at a point where she wants to die. I understand. Mm -hmm. But your point was, what does somebody do as a quad, a quad and then they can't administer the medication to themselves? Current law says they are ineligible for these laws. Okay. Well, I look forward to helping to support you uh, with that bill uh, come January. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wright, for bringing this to our community. Uh, and thank you for coming to our HSGP uh, digital speaker event. Uh, as always, uh, to everybody out there watching, if you enjoyed our content, then smash the subscribe button, contribute to our Patreon, or even better, become a member of HSGP. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we will hang out for after the recording stops if you'd like to chit-chat uh, with Dr. Dwight.